Good morning, and I'm so glad that you joined us once again in our study of spiritual living. And we're just going to finish out this little mini section within these 13 lessons today about choosing wholeness as a lifestyle. Today we're going to be addressing this idea of unselfish but confident. And as normal, all of our members should have received an email with the handout. And if you're joining us on our webpage right above this live stream, there will be a link for this. This one for this week is going to be two-sided, actually. It's one side's going to deal with being unselfish, and the other side's going to deal with confidence. I hope that you work through this during uh, this coming week. So what does it mean to be unselfish? So in order for us to better understand what this means, we first have to look at this idea of selfish. You know, in today's world, we have this concept or this idea of, I want my cake and eat it too. It's this idea of you're looking at yourself and only yourself, devoted to or caring only for yourself. And it's this idea of it doesn't matter to the extent you hurt others or take advantage of others. This self-centeredness is the whole world that you live in only pertains to you. You have no concept, you have no perspective, and you do not look beyond yourself. An example that I have, another lifetime ago, I was about 18 years old, I was working at an oil changing place. And at this place, when a car came in, there was different positions that people would work. The one that was over that lane where the car came in at, he would be over everything that is going on. And he would be operating right underneath the hood. And he would make sure everything is done. So what ended up happening was we found out a gentleman that was very charismatic, very easy to talk to, very uh, friendly. And he befriended everybody. What ended up happening was he would always volunteer to do the jobs that nobody else wanted to do. That normally pertained to vacuuming out the car or checking the tire pressure, checking the windshield wipers, that sort of thing. And he would even go to the extent at the end, he would be the one that would input this information into the computer. But the catch was that whoever was over that lane would get credit for it. And he would be the first one listed in who was working on the car. So this other gentleman, he would actually volunteer to input all of the information without saying anything. He would enter his name first uh, on, in the computer always as if he was the one in charge. So he was getting credit for being in charge and taking a leadership role, but yet doing the least of the responsibilities, something that did not require quite a bit. And finally, one day I was going through the files on the computer and I realized that he was on every single vehicle always. We called him in and we talked to him for a minute and trying to figure out how this happened. And he said that, oh, they don't mind that I took, you know, credit for this. So we brought in the other people and asked them. They didn't even have a clue of losing the credit or the uh, recognition for taking the leadership responsibility. And this gentleman that took advantage of the others, his comment well was, They didn't even know, so how did it hurt them? You see, that's the idea of, is all we're concerned with is ourself. It doesn't matter to what extent we hurt others, ignore others, take advantage of others, and it keeps going on like that. But remember, we're talking about being unselfish. But to get a better look at what that is, we have to understand what it is not. And it is not about only being concerned about yourself. It's about being concerned for others. So let's look at this first in 2 Timothy. Um, Chapter 3 is a good passage for this idea of what it means. Um, Starting in verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, malice, gossips, without self-control, brutal, 
haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And it goes on and explains this. And first I just want to explain in this verse 1, it says, in the last days. Now as Christians, we've been in this last days since the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are in the last age. It has been going on for quite a long time. Now, this idea of what it's describing in this section, we see it today. We can see it around us, and we can see it throughout history. This is nothing new. The writer of Ecclesiastes in chapter 1, verse 9, talks about this very idea that there is nothing new under the sun. What we face today is similar to everything we have faced uh, throughout history. So this idea of selfishness, self-centeredness, about being all of these things that are listed here, that's what it is to be unselfish. Uh, Excuse me, selfish. Uh, So let's look at this meaning of what it means to be unselfish. You know, and this little picture talks about this idea of helping others, even if they... Uh, even if you know that they are unable to help you in return. And see, this is a concept that even Christians can struggle with without even knowing it. You know, and the best example that I have for this is when a friend of mine and we go out to lunch, and one of us says, well, I'll go ahead and get this one. Our normal response to that would be grateful, but, well, I'll get next time. We have this concept of if you give me something, I have to give you something back. We cannot, well, let me say it this way. We struggle with receiving gifts. If somebody does something for me, I have to in turn do something for them in return. But that defeats the very purpose of what a gift is. A gift is giving without any expectations of receiving. And the problem is, is that's a worldly concept that has come into the body of Christ to an extent. And because of this mindset of always having to repay, it affects our relationship with God. Because he gives us free gifts within his body. We have these blessings. We have these abilities because of Christ. We have the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness, which are free gifts. But we get into this idea that I need to do something in return. Now, because of the free gifts, we need to be willing to do things. Don't get me wrong. Do not mishear me. But if we are doing things for the sake of it because we feel the expectation to repay instead of sharing ourselves, that's where it becomes a problem. So this idea of giving or sharing in abundance and without hesitation It's not, well, I'll help or I'll give because I have to. You know, remember during this little mini-series and throughout uh, these lessons, we talk about this idea that we put on this facade, we put on this masquerade of what we think others expect of us. If it's happy, if it's cheerful, if it's giving with a cheerful heart, But inside, we're not that way. That's the problem. Because what God wants from us is our our mind, our heart, and our reason for doing things. We need to be right inside, not just outside of ourselves. So it's this idea that we can pick up in uh, Colossians in chapter 3. is a good example of what this means to be... uh, Unselfish. Picking up in verse 12, it says, And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Verse 14, and be and beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. 
Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing with thank- thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to the God and the Father. So we have this idea of what it means to give. It's to give because we love, to give because we've been loved first, to forgive others because we have been forgiven. You see, that's the catch. That's the idea of what it means to be selfless. This idea that it's more important about the other than myself. You know, there's a lot of different passages we can look at in this idea of Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 I keep using the this uh, it starts off and it says and so then as long as we have opportunity let us do good to all men and especially to the household of faith we can jump over into Matthew chapter 25 starting in verse 31 this is the judgment scene the end of time and when Christ comes to sit on his glorious throne with all his angels with him. All the nations are gathered before him and he starts separating them one from another. He, sh- he places the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And he goes through and he says to the sheep, the ones on his right, enter in into heaven. Blessed are you because, and he starts listing, I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was sick, I was in prison, you visited me. And those on his right are asking, when did I do these things? And he says, when you did it to one of the least of these others, you've done it to me. And he says the same thing to the ones on the left, except they are condemned because they did not do it. And he goes through the same list. And they ask him the same question, when did we not do this to you? And he explains when you did not do it to the least of these other people. You see, this idea of being there for others, and this idea of in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, do good to all men, especially the household of faith. You see, we can have this concept, and I struggled with this for a long time, and my wife has helped me to understand this better. It's this idea I would view this was, Yeah, it says to be good to all men, but I know they're not going to use it for the right, for the good. They're going to misuse my gift to them if it's financial. They're going to use it for things that are not important, maybe to aid their addiction or maybe to continue into sin. So I need to safeguard them from continuing down that life. So I refuse to give. And my wife pointed out to me that we are told to give, to help, to look for others' needs in this world. And once you give, it is that person's responsibility to do with it accordingly. It's not us to judge them. It is us to give it to them. And then at the end of time, like in Matthew chapter 25, when the great judgment will happen. It is then when God will sort it out. But we can never allow the possibility of the misuse of our gift to stop us from giving. We have this idea that we need to govern what people are given in order to try to to help them. Now, I am not saying this. Please hear me clearly. I am not saying that we just give without any other thought about it. You see, we can look at Jesus' life. He always fulfilled the physical needs of people, but he also filled their spiritual. Now, if a congregation has a food pantry and they set up once a week in order to give out food to the needy, and How we should not do it is have all of this food ready, everything else in the grocery sacks, and they come and you just hand it to them and take their information so we know if they're coming back multiple times in order to safeguard ourselves and being good stewards, and we let them go on their way. What we possibly could do is use that as an opportunity to help them. 
Because a lot of times people that are in need don't know how to get out of that vicious cycle of whatever it is that they're in. Sometimes they need help to get out of it. And we can use that opportunity of handing out groceries in order to help them spiritually because that's what we're called to do, to meet the needs physically and spiritually. And we cannot do the one without the other. We cannot meet the people's needs spiritually unless we're meeting their needs physically. It's a balance act. And Christ did an an extraordinary, extraordinary example of this throughout his ministry. And that's what we are called to do. So we can look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. It says, But whoever has worldly goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. See, that's the catch. It's more than just the external representation of doing good. It goes back to our mind, our heart, and our reason for doing good. That's how we become selfless. That's how we become this concept of what Christ calls us to be. I'm not saying it's easy. I am not saying it's an easy path to go down. But we're called to do that. And it is a struggle, and sometimes we're going to fail, and we just need to get back up and continue. We need to help one another in this walk because the world does draw us. It entices us to be selfish. But Christ also draws us and calls us to be selfless. So that's the idea of what it means to be unselfish. The next part is we're going to be looking at this idea of what does it mean to be confident? Now, confidence is an interesting thing. Confidence is not an innate or uh, a fixed characteristic. And what I mean by that is you are not born with confidence. Rather, it's a learned behavior. Rather, it is this idea of wherever you are today in your confidence, you can improve upon it. It's a learned trait. It is just like anything else we learn. If we go back to our younger ages when we were still in school, maybe you still are in school. Why are you in school? It is to learn something new. Maybe it's for a career. Maybe it's for a ministry. Whatever it is, it is something that you lack or you need deeper understanding of. So you go to school to learn it. That is the same thing with confidence. And confidence is needed as Christians. And I am not saying, and we'll get to this, that we need to be arrogant about it. There is a difference. We need to balance out our confidence with this idea of selflessness, that it doesn't take a hold of us. But we are called to be confident. We can use the example, and many people struggle with this social awkwardness. We can develop the idea of having social confidence. A lot of times it's a learned trait, and sometimes it can be related down to as simply as this, that at some point in our life, we were trying to be involved socially, and we were rejected, we were made fun of, we were belittled, we were looked down upon, so therefore, we become anxious in social environments. Remember two lessons ago, we talked about this idea of anxiety into hope and this idea of what anxiety is, and we summed it up into four things that Christ faced in his last week on this earth as he journeyed to Jerusalem. And this idea that Satan was attacking him with four different fronts, this idea of uh, doubt, fear, loneliness, and guilt. And it is that concept that we turn to when we feel like we are rejected in a social environment. So we are socially awkward. We become uh, this idea of not comfortable in a social standing. But you can understand this and you can even see this. 
Even if I am socially awkward, I'm not comfortable. I get anxiety. I get the butterflies. I get sweaty when I have to be in front of a lot of people or around a lot of people. And even in a friendly environment, once I feel comfortable, once I feel that I can be trusted, that I won't be belittled or looked down upon or made fun of for who I am, what I say, what I believe, I start opening up and I feel more at ease. You see, that's what we need to do within the brotherhood. As Christians, we need to help each other to develop this idea of what it means to be confident. Because we need to have confidence. But what do we have confidence in? Is it in ourselves, Or is it in Christ, who we're called to be like as Christians? So let's look at that here for a moment. In 1 Peter in 1 Peter chapter, uh, where are we? Chapter 1, uh, excuse me, 2 Peter. In 2 Peter chapter 1, just verses 3 and 4, this first point, what we need to do, maybe, there we go, we need to remember ourselves. And it says, seeing that his divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness. We need to remember, remind ourselves daily that his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. We need to keep that in our forefront of thoughts. We need to remember this daily because that is what we are confident in. We are confident that he has provided everything through his divine power for us as Christians. Now, I am not saying that he is going to give me that Lamborghini that I want. It is not saying that he is going to give me a Learjet. What it is saying that he is going to give me everything in order to get to heaven. Sometimes it's not what we think. Sometimes it's beyond what we think. But we need to remember that it is his divine presence with us. We need to reinforce the second part of verse 3. Through the true knowledge of him who calls us by his own glory and excellence. We need to reinforce the knowledge of him daily. We need to read his word. We need to talk about him. We need to discuss with one another in order to reinforce the relationship we have with him. Because if we have this concept of who we truly are, we are Christians who make up the church, who have been called out. The very word church is ekklesia in the Greek, and it means to be called out. What are we called out of? The world. We are not citizens of this world. We are citizens of heaven. That's where we're going. That's where we want to be. But we need to reinforce that concept of who we are in this world. And then in verse 4, it says, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world by lust. We need to renew God's promises. We need to remember them. We need to discuss them, what he has promised us, because our God is a God of absolutes. And what I mean by that is he has promised that we can enter into heaven with him. Do we believe him or not? Do we think that he is a liar? Or do we twist that just a little bit? Well, it's more dependent upon me than him. If God is God, he is someone to be trusted. He is someone to be dependent on. He is someone that we can truly and fully depend on. Now, it doesn't mean that he is going to give us what I want, what I need, what I deserve in my worldly understanding of what those three are. Rather, he will fulfill his promise 
He has fulfilled from the Garden of Eden to the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. He has fulfilled that part of the promise, that we have a way back to him, that we can stand in his throne room with boldness and strength because of Christ. See, that's the catch. We need to talk more like this and have these types of discussion. So let's go over to Philippians. In Philippians chapter 1. As soon as I get there. Philippians 1, verse 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who has began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ. You see, the confidence is not in me. It is in Christ who is within me. It is through his Holy Spirit that dwells within me. That is the confidence that I must have. It is not about this idea of allowing my confidence to become, I'm going to use a technical term here, swollen head syndrome. It is that arrogance. It is that I'm better than you concept. And that's a hard road to walk sometimes if we're honest with ourselves it is easy to take this idea of achievement ability and talent that we have within Christ and allowing it to dictate my perspective of myself because that's how the world views it is we used to talk about terms about pull yourself up by your own bootstraps stand up for what is right wrong and otherwise we are reliant on self. But when we became Christians, when we took Christ on in baptism, we were raised in a newness of life, to walk in a newness. So what does that mean? That means it's not about me. It's about God. It's about Christ. It's about this idea of others, placing others before myself so what the big question what does this mean to me as a Christian and like I said we need to be careful that we don't allow this idea of our confidence to become arrogance we need to be careful because that's an easy trap to fall in because of the influences of the world because they are at times more concerned about self than others It is about what I can get out of this. There are manipulators. There are con artists. There are people who will take advantage of you. So we need to be careful that we don't follow that path because they might see instant gratification in their arrogance because of their uh, manipulation, because of their ill-gotten gains. And we see that, and we are drawn to that. But we need to remember who we are like we talked about. We are Christians. We're disciples of Christ, followers of Christ. And we make up the body of Christ, the church, which in its original language talks about that we are the called out. We are not part of the world. We don't long for the world. We long for heaven. It is that idea that we're talking about right now our very name, Christians. It's a badge of honor. It is something to be proud of, not afraid of, not intimidated because of others. We should stand up boldly in this world and allow others to understand that we are Christians. So what does that mean for me, though? It means a lot of things. It means that we are not to be like the world, like we keep saying, but we are to be different. So how do we do this? How do we find the difference? How do we find the strength, the confidence, the selflessness that we need to have to be different? In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, 
it says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Verse 2. So how does this happen? He explains it. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, which is good and acceptable and perfect. So how do we ensure and safeguard ourselves from being drawn into this world and not allowing ourselves to become selfish and using our confidence for arrogance? He sums it up here, Paul does. He sums it up quite simply. It's a renewing of your mind. Our mind is like any living thing. You need to feed it. You need to nourish your body. You need to take in and consume so many calories and so much water a day in order to live healthy. The same thing with our mind is true. What we put in is what will influence us. My mom used to always say, garbage in, garbage out. We're a product of our environment by our own choosing. It is that mentality. What do we feed ourselves? during this quarantine time of this coronavirus, and I know we're opening up a little bit more, opening up the availability of businesses, but during this time, just ask yourself, how much of that time did you spend in the Word of God? How much time did you spend in prayer? How much time did you seek out to help others around you How many of you had the confidence to do that? Or did you fall into that trap like I find myself sometimes? That I am sitting in my recliner, I got the remote for the TV, and I allow a program to be on that is plagued with sin that Christ died to remove from my life, but I allow it to be right before me. I don't even have to get up to change the channel. All I have to do is hit the button. But I don't sometimes. Is that what we did? Did we feed our mind with ill-gotten things, things that Christ died for to remove out of our lives? Or did I spend time devoting it to him and to others? You see... We're going to get into this idea, you know, it's the same little guy that we see with the scales, and it's a little different now. The the center point, the balance point is God. And what we need to make sure that we're not doing is this self-centeredness, this selfish, arrogant concept we could have about ourselves. Now, I keep saying that's the way of the world, and this is a very dominant influence from the world into the body of Christ. Not everybody in the world is this way. There are some very good people in the world that are not Christians. But we need to make sure that we safeguard ourselves to not be self-centered. So what do we need to become? Christ-centered. If we become Christ-centered, because that's what God calls us to be, when we took Christ on in baptism, that is what we profess, not just verbally, but physically. We took him on in our watery grave through baptism, and because we understood that it was to be about Christ in our lives, not about Chris, not about you. It wasn't based upon our determination of what is required to have a relationship with God. It was based upon what the Word of God said, and it calls us to deny ourselves, to place others before us. You know, we read in 1 John in this idea that if we have the means to help and we refuse The love of God is not in us. Now, that is not saying, and please hear me clearly, I am not saying that as Christians we cannot be rich. We cannot have material things. We cannot have things that we enjoy. 
if it's a speedboat, if it's a pontoon boat, if it is an airplane, if it is a second house, if it is a cabin in the woods, whatever it is, it is not saying that we cannot have it. But what we can find from reading throughout the Bible is that if those physical things are the reason that we cannot draw closer to God, then remove it. If those physical things in your life are the reason you cannot draw closer to God, remove it. That's a hard thing to say. It's an even harder thing to do. I am not saying that we must sell everything we have. But what I am saying is if what I have causes me to not draw closer to Christ, to God, to my brothers and sisters, to those people around me who are in need, then yes, I should sell it. Because like we talked about this idea of what it means to be a Christian. A Christian is a follower of Christ. It is a disciple of Christ. It is somebody who has taken Christ on. And those Christians make up the body of Christ, which is the church. And we are the called out. Our citizenship is not the physical. It is not of this world. It is not of White House, Texas. What it is to be in heaven. And he has laid out for us how to do that. And in today's lesson, we talked about this idea of how to be more selfless, how to be more confident in the right settings, in the right way, in order to bring glory and God, uh, glory to God in heaven. I always talk about Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God who is in heaven. But it must first come from our minds, our hearts, and our reason behind it. You see, this lesson was a hard one. It is. I understand how hard it is. But it's needed. If we don't talk about these hard things in our life that we're trying to overcome, that we're trying to set aside in order to draw closer to God, we never will. It doesn't mean that I'm going to be perfect at it. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to struggle. It does not mean that I will not fail in this. And the same applies to you. But what we need to do is keep trying. What we need to do is walk with one another and help to God. So the lesson is yours today. I pray that you can find a way to apply it in different small increments at first in order to draw closer to God, in order to be that example to those around you. The lesson's yours. Thank you very much.